Well, I'm going to have to tell on Robert. When he called and asked if I would do this, I said, I'll tell you what, I'd be happy to. Uh, Kathy and I were on Lesbos Island, a mile off the Turkish coast, uh, and we had video call. And so he called in April, and I said, I'll do it if you'll tag team it with me. We'll do a Mike and Al thing. We'll get some vests. We'll get up here and... <laughs> And I have a witness, Kathy, he was a video call and he was on speaker and I have a witness. He said, okay, well, you've seen crawfish. You know what they do? And that's exactly what Robert did. He went to crawfishing on me. So we are in a series in the gospel of Luke. I'd like for you to turn to the ninth chapter of Luke's gospel. We'll start at verse 28 and we'll go through verse 62 this morning. But I also want to provide some context from the first part of this chapter. Peter's confession is the high point of chapter 9. Uh, that confession in verse 20 where he says, You are the Christ. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Answering Jesus' question, Who do you say that I am? This is the apex of Luke's gospel. Everything flows up to this point, and then everything flows down from this moment. To acknowledge that Jesus is God, to be the Christ, the Messiah, God incarnate, is to make the right judgment concerning him. And Peter says it there by faith, but now he's going to see it by sight. This moment was so important in the life of the apostles, and it is for us as well. Peter makes this great confession, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, with the anticipation that the kingdom is coming immediately. But no sooner than he makes that confession, when in Luke 9 verse 22, Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, by the chief priests, by the scribes, and be killed. And after three days, rise again. This was so offensive to Peter and to the rest of them, that Peter began to rebuke Jesus. And he says, not on my watch. Mm. You remember Jesus turned to him and said, get behind me, Satan, for what you've got is your own plans and mine, not the plans of God. Whew. Mark 8, 33. The problem is, it's not our watch is. Jesus is saying, it's not your watch, Peter, it's my watch. Peter was committed to the glory, but not to the cross. He was committed to the exaltation, but not the humiliation. Jesus had just introduced the scandal of his death and his suffering to which the Jews was a stumbling block, and it was very difficult for them to handle this word about the death of Christ. It would prove to be more difficult for them when the reality of this unfolded in about six months from this very moment. When Jesus is arrested, they scatter, and Peter, the self-confessed strongest of them all, says, I'll never leave, I'll never forsake. Even if everybody else runs away, I'll be the guy standing there. And he denies Christ on three separate occasions, and the rest of them disappear in terror. It was horrendous, the cross, the death of Christ. And they will also suffer, and suffering is coming. They needed to be able to survive it. They needed to have the strength and endurance to get through it. And consequently, Jesus does something for them that is so rare in the New Testament. It's really the only time right here. He moves their faith to sight. He lets them see his glory. Jesus unveils himself. And if you look at a list of miracles, you probably won't find this one. If you find a book on miracles, this won't be one of them. Yet, this is the single greatest miracle recorded on the pages of the New Testament prior to the resurrection. 
And so let's pick it up here in verse 28. Read with me. About eight days after Jesus said this, after he said what? He told them he was going to die. He took Peter, John, and James with him and went up into a high mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor and they're talking with Jesus. What are they talking about? His departure. Literally, the word here is exodus, which he is about to bring for fulfillment at Jerusalem. And Peter and his companions were very sleepy. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory. And two men standing with him, and the two men were leaving Jesus. Peter says, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And Luke says, he had no idea what he was saying. And while he was speaking in mid-sentence, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered this cloud, and a voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, they saw nobody but Jesus alone. The disciples kept them to themselves. They didn't tell anyone at the time what they had seen. Why did Jesus do this? To anchor them in the confidence of the glory to follow the suffering. This is the visible revelation of the nature of Christ. Every one of the four Gospels has a purpose so that you may know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, God in the flesh, John 20 and verse 31. That's the purpose for every Gospel, for every recorded in your Bible, word recorded, that is the purpose. And here is the greatest evidence on the pages of the New Testament prior to his resurrection. This is assurance by sight that Jesus Christ is God. And now these are Jewish men. This is Peter, James, and John. They know that God has appeared in the Old Testament. He appeared and he revealed himself in visible form and it was always some kind of visible manifestation of light. A cloud, a, a light like an iridescent cloud. And they even came up with a word called Shekinah, the Shekinah glory of God. To describe this phenomenon. At, at the initiation of the priestly service in Leviticus 9, God appears in light. In Exodus 16, God appears to Israel as light. In Exodus 24, God appears to Moses as light. And Moses' face glows for six months. They had to put a veil on it. In Exodus chapter 20 and verse, uh, chapter 40 and verse 34, the tabernacle is completed and God appears in this Shekinah glory. In Numbers 14, when the children of Israel rebel against God, again, he comes as light. A couple of chapters later in the 16th chapter of Numbers, at the exposure of the sin of Israel, God appears in light. Again, in the same chapter, a few verses down at the rebellion of Israel against Moses and Aaron, God appears in light. In Numbers 20, God appears as light at Mirabah. And then when the temple is completed and dedicated, it's recorded in 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 11, when the glory of God descended on that place, everything stopped. His glory was so overwhelming, so massive, so suffocating, so heavy that no one could even stand up. The word glory in Hebrew is the word kavad. And one of the meanings of this word, in, in addition to the word glory as we use it, is the idea of weight. Not like time, but like mass. It's heavy. 
And this is why Paul expresses this exact idea in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 17 when he said that these light and momentary afflictions are suffering with Christ, are doing one thing, they are preparing us for a weight of glory that is beyond compare. And without the suffering, you're not prepared to receive that weight of glory. Paul says in Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6, that God lives in unapproachable light. The prophet Habakkuk in chapter 2 and verse 4 sees a future day when the full glory the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of his glory, and the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. There will be a time in the glorious kingdom of Christ when somehow his glory will literally cover this planet like, like a weighted blanket. Every knee will hit the ground. Because it has weight, it has mass, and it brings us to a stop. No one can stand in the full glory of God. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. You remember that Moses said to God, show me, I want to see your glory. And God says, you know that no one can see my face and live. This is Exodus 33. So I'm going to show you my backside. And so God says, I'll, I'll show you my glory. He tucks him in a rock and puts his hand over and lets him see a glimpse of his glory from his backside because the full glory would have consumed him. These glorious appearances of God in the Old Testament are confined or are limited or restrained so they don't destroy the viewer. What's God's purpose in revealing himself in light? In every single case, it is to strengthen their faith. To let them know that God is there, God is present. Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, and forever, and he will never leave us, and he will never forsake us. The living God has not remained silent, and though he is invisible, it has made it possible to be able to be seen. He is unveiled in shining light, and when we see these visions in Scripture, we, we see that God not only wants to be heard, he wants to be seen. And he's made it possible to be seen. But never before this moment has God revealed himself so magnificently, so precisely, as in the passage we just read together. This is the purest revelation of God. And here, that revelation is supernaturally intensified. There was evidence that Jesus was God by what he did, but there was no visible evidence looking at him. Isaiah 53 and verse 2, he had no beauty. No majesty to attract him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Nobody could see any difference on the outside, yet Hebrews 1, 3 says he is the radiance, the Shekinah glory of God. And the exact representation of his being, and Jesus is God manifest. 2 Corinthians talks about the glory of God shining in the face of Jesus, all of his attributes. Everything God is contained within him because he is fully God. He is called the Lord of glory. Amen. Mm. But that's veiled throughout all his life, and these guys had to come to the conclusion that he is God by what he does, not how he appears. And the disciples got to that point right here in verse 20. He said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. But as this thing starts going down from that pinnacle into the cross and to suffering and to rejection, including their own suffering, he gave them this glimpse of his unveiled glory. 
This is not like any experience anybody else has ever had. Peter wrote, we were eyewitnesses to his majesty when we speak of you concerning Christ. We are not following cleverly invented stories. This is not a fairy tale. We saw his majesty. We were eyewitnesses to his glory. When, Peter, when did you see it when we were with him on that mountain? 2 Peter 1, 16 and 18, Paul, and Peter gives that account. John says the same thing. We write to you concerning the word of life. We've seen it. We've touched it. Our hands have handled it. We beheld his glory. He was made manifest to us. John 1 and 14, we beheld his what? Glory. Matthew records this in chapter 17. Mark records this in chapter 9. Luke records it here. Why? Because this is so very important. You want proof that Jesus is God? He says, I'll show you my glory. So he took with him Peter, James, and John. These guys are the inner circle. The most intimate friends, James and John, are brothers. Jesus gives them a nickname pretty early on called the Sons of Thunder. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Peter's the leader of this outfit, obviously. They're very close to Christ, and when we find them in Mark 14, when Jesus goes to Gethsemane to pray, to the anticipation of, of the cross, he takes with him Peter, James, and John again, and he takes them there for fellowship and to pray with him, and so he takes these three. Why did he take three? Deuteronomy says that truth is confirmed by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Matthew 18, verse 16 says, when you're dealing with people's sins in the church, you confirm their response by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Second Corinthians 13, Paul says, I'm coming, Corinth, and I'm going to deal with y'all, but I'm not, when I get there, I'm not just going to go willy-nilly through the church. I'm going to find the people, and I'm going to confirm what's happening by the witness of two or three witnesses. In 1 Timothy 5, Paul tells that an elder, before he's rebuked, must have what? Whatever sin confirmed by two or three witnesses, because that is the proper number to confirm the truth. These three are the most trustworthy, they're the most intimate of Christ's followers. And he was transfigured before them. Luke 9, 29 says it was while he was praying that it happened. Verse 32 says while he was praying and it happened, they were, guess what? Very sleepy. Isn't that exactly what they did in Gethsemane? Later on, when they went up to pray, this is Mark 14, 37, they were sleeping there too. And asking why these guys can't stay awake with Jesus? The best answer probably comes from Luke 22, 45. When you look at their sleeping in Gethsemane, it says they were sleeping from sorrow. Sorrow will make you sleep. Because you want to get out of it. You want to escape. You want to get around this bad situation. You want to walk away. You want relief. That's what it was here, and, and that's, this is a relief from sadness. They're devastated by the news of Jesus' death. They don't even know yet that it's going to be a crucifixion. But he did tell them, you're going to have to take up your cross and follow me, so that may be a pretty good indicator but it was way more than they could handle and they just shut down and they, they sleep from sorrow. And while they're asleep, Jesus prays alone and he's transfigured before them. The word here is metamorpheo, which we get the word metamorphosis. It's two Greek words, morphe, meaning body or form, and meta, meaning change. His form was changed. Nothing changed on the inside, right? He's God. But his outside changed. The word metamorpheo is used only four times in the New Testament. It's used in Mark 9 and in Matthew 17 on this text in the Transfiguration. So it's applied twice to Jesus the other two times. 
are applied to us, the same verb to describe the same thing in Romans 12, 2. It says that as believers, we are to be transformed. By the renewing of our minds in 2 Corinthians 3.18, Paul says that as we gaze into the glory of Jesus, we will be transformed into his image from one level of glory to another. By the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you, can people see Jesus living in you? Jesus talks about salt and light and a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. So we're talking about a radical kind of transformation. Jesus' nature could not change, only his appearance. And this, this, by the way, this is not some kind of mental or emotional experience for them. This is a physical experience for them, a real experience, not a vision. Yes, the glory of God shines in the face of Jesus spiritually, but here it happens actually. The blazing glory of his divine nature came through his humanity. He pulled the veil of his humanity back. And it was like the sun shining at high noon. Revelation 1, when John articulates a vision from Christ in verse 16, he says his face was like the sun shining in its strength at high noon in a cloudless sky. That's what they saw. Luke says it was white and gleaming, a flash of lightning like linear lightning. Jesus always possessed this glory, but he kept it veiled. In John 17, he, he tells us, yeah, I've always possessed this glory. And it was covered until this moment. This is the glory that will be fully revealed, Jesus said in Matthew 24. For as lightning comes from the east and is visible even in the west, so it's going to be like the coming of the Son of Man, linear lightning. And Revelation says that the people in the world are going to see that glory of God and they're going to cry out for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them to hide them from the face of his glory. Matthew 25 says the same thing. He's coming in the fullness of his glory. Revelation 19, he's coming in full blazing glory. So here in Luke 9, 32, when Jesus was transfigured and they became fully awake, they saw his glory. But then the scene changes. Listen to what it says here in Luke 9, 30 and 31. Two men Moses and Elijah appeared in glorious splendor, and they're talking with Jesus. They're speaking of his exodus, which he is about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. What's the subject? His death, his suffering, his cross. I suppose the disciples might have thought they'd be talking about the kingdom and the glory and the overthrow of the Romans, the establishment of the Messiah's throne over the whole earth, but they're not. Here Moses and Elijah are talking about the death of the Messiah. Again, these are two very special men. And the testimony of these two men is a confirming testimony. Because they are two witnesses and they're talking about the death of Christ. Larry, you mean that Moses and Elijah were aware that the Messiah must die? That the cross is actually part of God's plan and it's not an interruption and Moses and Elijah affirm this? Yeah, that's exactly what this is about. Moses is the greatest leader in Israel's history in authority. He is a king even though he never had a throne. In word and in message he was a prophet. In service to God he's every bit a priest serving God's people on his behalf. He's the author of the Pentateuch, the law, the agent that God gave his holy law through. The very first messianic prophecy came through Moses. 
He's like, you guys are, think Moses is all that. Moses was writing about me. If you're going to have somebody give testimony to the fact that the Messiah has to die and give his life as a ransom for many, couldn't get a better witness than Moses, unless it was Elijah. He could stand with Moses because he fought every violation of that law. He battled the nation's idolatry and their unfaithfulness with courage and words of judgment, and he validated his message with miracles. Did you know that there were only two miracle eras in the Old Testament? You know what they were? The time of Moses and the time of Elijah. You know it. It happened in Egypt. It happened in the wilderness. You can read about Elijah's miracles in 1 Kings chapter 17, 18, 19, 2 Kings chapter 1, chapter 2. Here are the two most trustworthy eyewitnesses that no one could bring the apostles more assurance and confidence that the death of Jesus Christ was part of the plan than to hear it from Moses and Elijah. And here they are. They're in glory, confirming the glory to come. They're talking about Jesus' death, his suffering. So he got it all right here, right? But Peter, of course, has to talk. So in verse 33, Peter said to Jesus, and you would think after the last thing he said, he would have kept his mouth shut. When he rebuked from the Lord for saying, no, no, you're not going to die. Get behind me, Satan. He blurts out again, interrupting their conversation in mid center Master, this is good for us to be here. I have a great idea. We're going to put up three tabernacles, three sanctuaries, three temples. I can see it now. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Why do you think he said that? What's running through this man's mind, I think, is still the problem of suffering and death. It has got to go away. Peter's not giving up on this. He's a tenacious guy, so his plan is this. Let's end all this right here. We'll make these tabernacles. We'll finish off this deal. We'll get right into the kingdom. This is good. This is good. He wants to establish the kingdom on the spot. We got Moses, we got Elijah, we got Jesus in glory. Let's launch the kingdom now and eliminate all the death and all the suffering. For Peter, this is total religion. He's got the law, he's got the prophets and grace standing right there. He's like, this is going to be like a Disney world of Jesus, man. On this mountain, the whole world is coming to this mountain. While he was still speaking, verse 34 a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice comes from the cloud saying three things. This is my son, Isaiah 42, 1, whom I have chosen, Psalm 2, 16. Listen to him, Malachi 4. Here's God the Father. The father rebukes Peter in mid-sentence and says, No! That's my son. Those two guys are not equal to my son. They are here to give witness to his glory. Friends, this is the third witness. Moses is one, Elijah is two, and here's the third witness. Here comes the father's testimony. He'd just been rebuked by Jesus, and now he gets rebuked by the Father. Bless his heart. <laughs> what does he say? Listen. Listen to what? Listen to what he's saying about his death. Listen to what he's saying is about his suffering because his life is about to become your life. His cross is about to become your cross. His suffering is about to become your suffering. And when the disciples heard the voice, they were engulfed in this cloud. And in Matthew 17 and 6, it says they fell face down and they were terrified. I just love this, just flat. It's the same thing that happened in 1 Kings chapter 8 when the glory of God descended on that temple. And here comes the weight. 
If you look at Mark 9 and verse 8, Jesus came to them and he touched them and he said, get up, don't be afraid. And all at once they looked around and they saw no one with them anymore except Jesus alone. The preview of the kingdom and the glory was over. It was gone. And now it is time to come down from this mountaintop experience back into the reality of a fallen, sinful world. And that's exactly what happens, continuing on in verse 37. The next day, when did this happen? The next day. Doesn't take long. They came down from the mountain, and there is a large crowd ready to meet them. And a man in the crowd calls out, Teacher, I beg you to look for my son. He's my only child. A spirit seizes him, and he suddenly screams. It throws him into convulsions, and he foams at the mouth, and I, it scarcely ever leaves him. It's destroying him. I begged your disciples to drive it out, but they couldn't. And Jesus says, You unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I stay with you? How long should I put up with you? Bring your son here. And even while the sin, son was coming, the demon threw him to the ground into a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the impure spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. We have all experienced times of exaltation on that mountain. And we've seen things from God's perspective in a way that we haven't ever before. And we want to stay there. But God will never allow us to stay there because the true test of our spirituality, the true test of Christ in us, the hope of glory, is in descending from that mountain. If we only have the power to go up, something's wrong. It's a wonderful thing to be on a mountain with God, but a person only gets there so that they can go back down into that fallen, demon-possessed world and lift up the name and the glory of Jesus Christ. What happens on the mountaintop is not meant to teach us anything. It's meant to make us something. Transformation. We are sent out to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're inclined to think that everything that happens in the valley is to be turned into some useful teaching, all of our suffering. In actual fact, it's turned into something even better than teaching, namely character, and that is the character of Christ in us. Can people see Jesus in you? So it's in this same moment right here, after healing this demon-possessed boy, the next day after coming down, Jesus tells the disciples, look at this in verse 43, everybody is amazed at the greatness of God, and while everyone's marveling of everything that Jesus just did, he takes this moment, verse 44, and he says, listen carefully about what I'm going to tell you. It's almost like he grabs your face and says, listen to what I'm about to say. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. There's going to be suffering. If they didn't understand what it meant. It was hidden from them, so they could not grasp it. And they were afraid to ask him about it. And then an argument started about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And again, Starting in verse 51, as the time approached for him to be taken up into heaven, Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem, resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready. But the people did not welcome him because he was going to Jerusalem. And the Samaritans hated the Jews and the Jews hated the Samaritans. So here comes James and John. Hey, we got an idea. You want us to call down giant fireballs from heaven and smoke these guys? I'm talking nuke them now. 
sons of thunder, just like Elijah did. And Jesus turns and rebukes them. Again, there's so much rebuking going on, isn't there? At the pride and arrogance of us. Luke 9, 56, and then Jesus and the disciples went to another village. Hmm. They were walking along the road, and a man said, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Verse 59, another man comes, and as Jesus says, follow me. Jesus is initiating this. And he replied, Lord, first let me go bury my father. Oh, poor guy just lost his dad. You know what? That's not what's happening there. It can't be. If you're a Jew and your parent dies, it's like the most important event in your life, and you got three days, 72 hours to get him in the grave. He wouldn't have even been there. What this is literally saying is, I need for my mom and dad to pass, and then I'll get the inheritance, and then I'll be self-funded, and then I'll go do your will. I'm not ready yet. And Jesus says, what is now even more scathing, let the dead bury their own dead. But you, what are you supposed to do? Go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. I'm just not ready yet. There's coming a time that I will be, but I'm not ready yet. And Jesus replies in verse 62, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. These are tough words to hear. But Jesus makes it very clear that there is a cost to being his disciple. To put it plainly, Jesus says, if you're not willing to sacrifice your life, take up your cross and follow him, you can't have any part of him. What would you be willing to give up to follow Jesus? How desperate would you have to be in order to turn your back on everything and everyone in your life, to lose everything so that you can have Jesus? This is an everyday reality for those that come out of Islam. To leave the religion of Islam is punishable by death. They know it. And their families know it. Everybody knows it. Over the past 12 years, Kathy and I have witnessed former Muslims experience and live out Jesus' exact words in Matthew chapter 10 that literally cost them everything to come to Christ. Sacrifice is a word that brings to mind many ideas and emotions. Christians will often hear that word and they'll think about the endless blood sacrifice that God required to deal with the sins of his people. And then they'll turn their thoughts to the fact that Jesus came to the earth, the ultimate final sacrifice for sin, concluding that as a result of Jesus' sacrifice, no sacrifice is required on my part. But is that really what Jesus taught? Matthew 10, starting in verse 34, Jesus says, Don't suppose that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. The man's enemies will be the members of his very own household. And what Jesus does right there is quote Micah 7 and verse 6. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter or more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. In Mark 8, Jesus said, whoever wants to save their life is going to lose it, but whoever loses their life for me in the sake of the gospel, they're going to save it. 
Luke 14, 33, Jesus said, in the exact same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. And so while the whole world is trying to figure out, determine if Jesus is worthy of this kind of sacrifice, Jesus knows whether or not we're worthy of him. Dietrich Bonhoeffer summed it up in saying that salvation is a free gift, but following Jesus will cost you your very life. The word sacrifice takes us to the very heart of the gospel. Do I follow Jesus? Is Jesus my life or I just added a form of Jesus to the life that I want to live? If my life is driven more by my own desires, comforts, opinions, and preferences, I may not be following Jesus at all. Do we desire his eternal life in us, yet want nothing to do with his death or suffering? Ask yourself, what happens on an altar? Death. Death is what happens on an altar. Many Jesus followers come to the altar of repentance and then walk away having dealt with their sin but never dealing with their sinful nature. Only my own death in Christ can accomplish that. You hear people say all the time, man, I, I, when I sin, I put Jesus back on that cross. You, guess what? You don't have the power to do that. Jesus doesn't need to be on that cross. You know who does? You do. Jesus says, being his disciple involves participating in his death, suffering the same shame and disgrace he bore. Hebrews 13, 13, let us go to him outside the camp. Losing my life, denying myself daily and finding my life only in him, only in death, the absolute giving up of every part of myself, daily bearing the cross of the crucified Christ in all of its power to kill and make dead in me everything that is not of him. Only then is his life made manifest in me. The only way to life is the way of the cross. Paul puts it this way, I want to know Christ, yes. To know the power of his resurrection in the participation of his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, so that somehow I can attain to the resurrection of the dead, Philippians 3.10. The reality is, when I'm obedient to Jesus, I am crucified with Christ, I no longer live. But Jesus Christ lives in me. His life becomes my life because he lives, I now live. John 14, 19, when I take up my cross every day, submitting and laying down my life before him as a living sacrifice, Romans 12, 1, I allow him to shape me into his own likeness with ever-increasing glory, 2 Corinthians 3, 17. He moves me from life to death. I don't move myself. Paul says, for we who live, how does he move me from life to death? Paul says it right here in 2 Corinthians 4, 11. We who are living are always being given over to death so that the life of Jesus may also be made manifest in our mortal bodies. Death is the narrow gate. Death is is the narrow road that leads to life in Christ. He must do something new in me. Unless I am recreated, I can never fit into the new realm of his kingdom. Jesus tells us plainly, unless one is born again, they cannot see the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. No one can enter the kingdom unless they're born of the water and the spirit. John chapter 3. Paul restates the same idea in 1 Corinthians 15. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. No matter the efforts I undertake... No matter how educated or cultured or seemingly improved 
I may appear, my flesh will always be and only ever be Christless. My worthiness to belong to Jesus is determined solely by my origin, the origin to which I belong. Do I belong to the old creation or the new? Entering the kingdom hinges on this one question, the question of our origin. That which is born of flesh is flesh and it'll never be anything else. That which originates from the old creation can never enter the new creation. Only when I am able to accept the fact that I have been crucified with Christ and my flesh no longer lives will I be able to comprehend that I can never again contribute anything from my flesh. I'm new. I'm changed. He must see his life manifest in me. It is within the cross of Christ that God put to death all things that were not part of himself. He has now reconciled all things to himself through the blood of Jesus Christ, Colossians 1. The cross stands forever as a sentinel which eternally proclaims that God has put to death all things from the old realm. Everything that had its origin before the resurrection is wiped out. Nothing of the old may pass beyond the cross. It all ends there. My sinful nature cannot pass. Is the resurrection, it is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which now stands at the threshold of this new kingdom. And it is the only means by which anyone ever enters. The resurrection is God's new starting point for his new creation. Resurrection life in Christ is only available to those who have died in Christ. This is the real question of my worthiness for the kingdom of heaven. This choice does not happen just once. It happens every day single day that I daily take up my cross deny myself and follow him and quit asking him to follow me this is the true sacrifice that Jesus asked of each of us while it is the blood of Jesus that deals with our sin it is the cross of Jesus Christ that deals with us Pray with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for meeting us in this place as we gaze into your face of glory. We are so glad that you didn't skip the cross. So glad that you didn't skip the suffering. We're so glad that we have seen your glory and beheld you in your majesty. We long for the day to see that sky rip open and see this linear lightning that is going to cover this planet. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. It's in your power and in your name that is above every name that we pray. Amen.